نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احل العقدتم من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعل لی وزیغ من اخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین اللہم الہمنا رشتا و عزنا من شرور انفسنا اللہم ارنا الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارنا الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہو Verse number 20, and mention when Musa a.s. said to his people, O my people, remember the favor of Allah upon you when he appointed among you prophets and made you possessors and gave you that which he had not given anyone among the worlds. So from verse number 20 to verse number 26, Allah is going to narrate the story of Hazrat Musa a.s. and his followers. Now, we know what happened is that when after uh, Hazrat Musa a.s. and his companions, they were blessed with freedom and uh, with freedom and they were settled in the desert of Sinai. Allah blessed them with uh, springs and fountains and Allah blessed them with the shadow of shade of the clouds and Allah blessed them with man and salwa and Allah gave them the Ten Commandments and then there were revolutions of the divine scripture of the Torah were given to them to establish and to implement the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once they were being blessed by all these blessings and bounties of Allah, Allah ordered them. Through revolutions given to the Musa a.s., Allah ordered them to fight, go ahead, have a battle, have a um, fight, the people of uh, Palestine. The people of Palestine, uh, Allah ordered the followers of Hazrat Musa a.s. to go for jihad and to liberate the people of Palestine because Palestine was what? Arzil Muqaddisa, this was the sacred land. This was the land which was the birthplace. This was the land which was the birthplace and the homeland of all the prophets. And this no doubt was the, was the place of the Bani Israel also. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the followers of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam to make jihad and to have and to fight in the path of Allah and to liberate Palestine, the birthplace and the home place of the homeland of all the prophets. And at the same time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordered them to make jihad for the sake of liberation of Palestine, Allah at the same time in the revolutions had also promised them victory. Allah had promised them victory, but they were stubborn people and they were stubborn, obstinate, disobedient transgressors. And uh, they did not also show reliance in Allah. Because we know that what are the believers, they are, uh, what sort of a behavior all believers are supposed to adopt is that when they are made with, when they are given any commandment, they are supposed to obey the commandment and stick up to the obedience with full with full uh, patience, and then to rely on the promises of Allah, which Allah has made regarding the obedience. So they, neither were they obedient, they were disobedient, neither were they patient, they were impatient, and they were not at all reliant on the, on the promise of victory. So they tried to act very clever and they tried to behave even more wiser Na'uzubillah, than the Prophet and then, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Na'uzubillah, they sent a team. They sent a team from the people of Bani Israel to investigate the conditions of Palestine. And the team was instructed by Hazrat Musa alayhi salam that once you go to Palestine and you find out the conditions there, the situations there, do not come and openly announce the conditions and the state of affairs you come, uh, you happen to find out during your investigations, but just come and hand me over the piece of information. I will handle it the way I want to. 
but they were they were stubborn obstinate foolish disobedient people who would always disobey regarding all the commandments of Allah and, and their messenger so the team much against the instructions of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam who had instructed them to secretly give him the news the team uh, the team came back and uh, the investigating team they announced they announced to all the people of bani israel that the people of palestine they were tall they were strong and they were very well built and they were like dwarfs in front of the, the people of bani israel they were like dwarfs in front of the people of palestine and you will not be able to face them so what happened is that they came up with refusal total refusal of obedience to allah and to the messenger has a musa alayhi salam and they refused to do jihad and they were disobedient and they were not patient and they did not rely in the promise of allah so they refused the order of jihad with for which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised them victory and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was furious and they invited the wrath of allah to fall on them so now we will uh, go through the verses and you will be able to understand them better allah says mention mention when musa said to his people oh my people remember the favor of allah upon you when he appointed among you prophets and made you possessors and gave you that which he had not given anyone among the worlds oh my people enter the holy land what arzil muqaddisa the land of palestine enter the holy land which allah has assigned to you and do not turn back from fighting in the cause of allah and thus become losers they were ordered and they were warned at the same time they said o musa alayhi salam in the indeed within it is a people of tyrannical strength and indeed we will never enter it until they leave but if they leave then we will enter said two men from those who feared to disobey among whom allah had bestowed flavor they said enter upon them enter upon them through the gate for when you have entered it you will be predominant and upon allah rely if you should be the believers the behavior of these two obedient believers was exactly the way all the believers are supposed to behave when they receive the commandments and promises of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to obey allah with full patience and with full reliance because when the obedient when the obedient believers they they stick to their obedience with patience and reliance that what happens is the rule of allah in allah ma'aswabirin allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help allah's protection allah's support befalls them joins them and they come out victorious and they are rewarded they receive the rewards of this world and the world hereafter also Allahumma ja'alni saburan wa ja'alni shakura they said o musa alayhi salam indeed we will not enter it ever as long as they are within it so go you and your lord and fight indeed we are remaining right here musa alayhi salam said my lord indeed i do not possess except myself and my brother so part us from the defaintly disobedient allah said then indeed it is forbidden to them for 40 years in which they will wander throughout the land so do not grieve over the defaintly disobedient people verse number 27 verse number 27 to 32 these are the verses which which narrate the story of the sons of hazrat adam alayhi salam i would uh, relate the events uh, in brief and then when we go through the verses it will be easier for us to understand the messages of the verses now we understand that when by the order of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hazrat adam alayhi salam and his wife hazrat hawa they had been shifted and migrated to this land then by the order of allah to increase the human population hazrat hawa every year every year she used to give birth to two children a male and a female so every year hazrat adam alayhi salam used to have a son and a daughter by birth now the eldest son of hazrat adam alayhi salam was qabil and the next was habil 
with Cain and Abel, as has been mentioned in a few books of literature as well. So they were Kabil and Habil, the first two sons. Kabil started uh, having agriculture and he made a colony by the name of Kanita. Habil started rearing goat and sheep and he established a colony by the name of uh, Sitra. When they grew up and they grew up to adulthood, by the time their job, their all the affairs, they had also expanded and they needed helping hands. And moreover, when they reached adulthood and they were mature, then also they, de they developed certain physical desires like desires for sex, etc. This they asked with their father. They presented their problems and their requirements and their desires in front of their father. And then Hazrat Adam salam, was guided through revolution. And uh, with revolutions from Allah, he was instructed to tell both the sons that they will marry their twin sister born with the other brother. That this was the order which was given through uh, the revolutions to Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. You, you can see clearly that uh, they were ordered to marry their twin sister. These orders are very, very different from the orders of nikah, the limits of nikah, the halal, the haram, the mahram relations, which have been explained by Quran and Hadith. Because you know, under those conditions, that was the only permissible, that was only possible. So it was made permissible. So by this order, Habil was to marry Kabil's sister, Loza, and Kabil was to marry Habil's sister, Aklimia. Now, somehow, Loza was more beautiful than Aklimia. So Kabil got jealous. He developed jealousy from his brother that he is getting an option of a better looking wife. Now, you know what envy and jealous in the heart leads to? This feeling of being envious, it made him refuse to obey the order of Allah and of his father. This is how important it is to stay away from any feelings of jealousy or any feeling of envy because envy leads to disobedience. Envy leads to disobedience of Allah, of the Prophet, and even of the Father. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all from this negative feeling. And then Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, as ordered by Allah, when Kabil refused to accept the order of Allah, the order of Hazrat Adam, and even which was the order of his father, then Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, as ordered by Allah, he told them to sacrifice their animals. Now, what happened here also, since Kabil, his basic preferences and his basic priorities in life was what? The worldly riches. So he miserly, he picked up one of the smallest and the weakest of the animals, and he sacrificed that. He presented that for being sacrificed in the path of Allah. Whereas Habil, who was basically a God-fearing person, he his primary his primary priority was hereafter. So he chose while while sacrificing or while presenting for sacrifice in the path of Allah, he chose out the best of animals for the sacrifice. Now, in those days, what the condition was regarding the sacrificing of animals was that at that time, by the will of Allah. Who, whoever sacrificed an animal and by the order of Allah that sacrifice was accepted by Allah, then what it used to be indicated by the fact that a fire used to come from the heaven and the fire used to consume the, consume the body of the sacrificed animal. And this used to show what? This used to prove and highlight that the sacrifice was, was accepted by Allah and inshallah will be rewarded by the reward also. So similarly, what happened was, according to the state of affairs, when Habil and Kabil, they sacrificed the animals they had brought, then a fire came from the heaven and it consumed. Habil's sincerely presented um, sacrificed animal and Kabil's animal was left behind to rot and decay. So what happened more was this, the envy was further pumped up. He was even more jealous. And this led to severe envious feelings, the flame of envy and jealousy spreading up and uh, rising up in the hearts of um, Kabil. It finally ended up to hatred of the younger brother. And finally, he did what? He threatened to murder the younger brother. 
but the younger brother was God fearing and he did not respond. He did not retaliate. And finally, the envious elder brother did what? Envy led him to do what? The envy in the heart of Kabil let him, guided him to the murder of his younger brother. This is envy. This is the importance of identifying any feeling of being jealous of anything, of anybody around us. Because, you know, in the materialistic world of today, we need to purify our hearts. These were the sons of a prophet. These were the sons of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. When envy entered and blew up in his heart as flame, it opened the door of such a major sin. This envious feeling, this negative frame of mind, this jealousy, this negative state of mind, it, it just did what? It opened the doors of such a major sin, murdering of the younger brother with his own hands. And once he had done this, he was he regretted after committing this, but obviously it was too late. And uh, this was the first murder. This was the first death. And uh, by the time the, uh, the method of burial, it was not known to them. And so he was upset and he did not realize how to conceal the dead body of his brother. And then by the order of Allah, a crow was sent. And the crow, by digging uh, at the, there was a fight between the two crows and one of the crow killed the other and then dug up the earth and then uh, made a grave and buried the um, dead crow. And this was done to show uh, Kabil how to bury his brother. And when Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, he found out the whole state of affairs, he passed on the information about the death of um, her son to Hazrat Hava. And by the time, as I've already told at that time, none of the people had died. And so they did not know what death was. And she was unaware. And she asked that what death was. And Hazrat Adam alayhi salam explained and she, he told her that her son he would no longer walk he would not talk or he would not eat and drink and so she screamed and she mourned and she fainted and we know by the teachings of prophet sallam that he has uh, whenever he used to take pledge from the muslim women who used to enter into islam he used to make the pledge that they will be when at the, at the at the time of death they would not make noha and they would not scream or they would not strike their faces or they would not pull their hair or do not uh, tear their clothes and they would not do mourning in any form so this is what this is not lawful in islam and so um, next five years, because of the because of this stress and because of this um, grief, out of this grief, she was infertile for the next five years. Hazrat Hava was infertile for the next five years. And after five years, by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she was again, she gave birth to a son. This was the gift of Allah. And he has been known by traditions as Hibatullah. And uh, as at the Adam alayhi salam, we learn from traditions that uh, death attended to him on the day of Friday. And uh, there are weak traditions which do report that uh, his grave is in a place in Jeddah. So now going through the whole events, if I read through the verses, inshallah, they will be uh, easily understood. Verse number 27, and recite to them the story of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam's two sons in truth when they both offered a sacrifice to Allah and it was accepted from one of them but not accepted from the other. Said the later, I will surely kill you, said the former. Indeed, Allah only accepts from the righteous who fear. If you should raise your hands against me to kill me, I shall not raise my hands against you to kill you. Indeed, I fear Lord, the Lord of the worlds. Indeed, I want you to obtain thereby my sin and your sin, so you will be among the companions of fire. And that is the recompense of the wrongdoers. 
and his soul, which soul, the jealous, the envious soul of the brother and his soul permitted to him the murder of his brother. So he killed him and became among the losers. Allahumma la taj alna minhum. Then Allah sent a crow searching in the ground to show him how to hide the disgrace of his brother. He said, oh, woe to me. Have I failed to be like this crow and hide the body of my brother? And he became of the regretful. Because of that, we decreed upon the Christian of his, uh, children of Israel that whoever kills a soul, unless for a soul of a corruption done on the land, it is as if he had slain mankind entirely. This is how disliked it is. And this is what the punishment of a person is who murders a person, a Muslim, intentionally, without any reason. And whoever saves one, that is a person, a Muslim person saving a life, whoever saves one, it is as if he has saved mankind entirely. And our messenger had certainly come out to them with clear proofs. Then indeed, many of them, even after that, throughout the land, they were transgressors. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Verse number 33, indeed the penalty for those, indeed the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and his messengers, number two, and strive upon the earth to cause corruption is none, but they will be either killed or crucified or that their hands and feet be cut off from the opposite sides or they will be exiled from the land. That is for them a disgrace in this world and for them in hereafter is a greater punishment. Now in this verse number 33, <coughs> this has been, this verse was revealed following an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this incident has been repeated, has been um, revealed, has been uh, related in Bukhari also two tribes, the tribes of Uql and Urena. They were from the suburbs of, uh, they were from far off and they came to Medina. They embraced Islam and after accepting Islam, they stayed over in Medina and the purpose of their staying on in Medina was they wanted to learn the teachings of Quran and Hadith and to find out more and learn about Islam. So now when they were residing and staying over in Medina, they fell sick and they got sick. Like what? What we learn from traditions is that their face and their skin, they, it turned yellow. Their face, their skin and eyes, they turned yellow and their bellies, they swell up. Most probably it was what? It was something like a jaundice, the liver being infected and the person being jaundiced and the belly and the abdomen being, um, being bulging out and being swollen. So now what Prophet Wasallam advised them to go to the suburbs of Medina in the outskirts of Medina. This was a mountainous area with valley and with forests around. And um, Prophet Wasallam told them to go off to this place. The climate was very suitable. The environment was very healthy and was also instructed that there were tribesmen who reared the camels of Zakat. And Prophet ﷺ advised them to stay in the open, fresh air and also to drink the milk of the she camels and the urine of the camels. They will get healthy. This is a tradition which has been highly criticized, saying that it is these Muslims, they say that Atahuru Shatar Iman, and they claim and they mention that they are purified and they stay, they say that they try to keep their clothes and bodies and everything. They try to mention and highlight so much about purification and look. Look, here they are. They're talking about haram drinks and they're talking about the, um, uh, the unlawful, the prohibition of all forms of intoxications and whatnot. And look at them. Look at them here. Their prophet, Na'uzubillah Suma, Na'uzubillah bin Zalik, instructing them to take and consume the urine of the she camels. What was all this about? With my little... Little knowledge of my scientific and my medical knowledge, I would want to explain this to a little extent is that, you know, that they had a liver disease. And we do know that in liver 
conditions affecting the liver, the pH of the blood, the alkalinity and the acidity of the blood gets affected. And we need to alkalinize the blood to keep the homeostasis and the internal environment of the body and the blood homeostasis to maintain it. The blood has to be alkalinized. In those days, there were no chemicals. There were no chemicals and uh, which would help us do that. So the urine, since it is alkaline, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was informed by revolution to instruct them to do so. So under forced conditions were they suggested to consume the urine because it was alkalinized to alkalinize the body to maintain the internal pH and the homeostasis of the body. So rather than going into criticism, we need to understand what 14 year, 1400 years Hence, in those times, with no scientific, with no medical advances of today, and with Prophet ﷺ, who did not even know how to read and write, coming up with such a medical, such a scientific advice, means what? Means what? That the source of hadith is what? Is hidden revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the source of Islam and the teachings of Islam are directly from the divine source. How could Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1400 years back tell something so scientific and medical? And what happened was that these people, they stayed with, the, with there and they were eating and they were drinking and then they got well and they got healthy and they got strong, but they were thankless people and they were corruptors and what they did was what malice and what corruption they caused was that they killed the host tribe they killed the men of the host tribes they cut their hands and feet how persecuting and how torturing their behavior was that they cut their hands and feet and they forced iron hot iron uh, needles to their eyes and they let them die thirsty and hungry all by themselves and they fled themselves and they took all the camels also and they looted they plundered they took all the camels and on their way back when they were leaving they announced that they had reverted to their ancestral ancestral religion and that they had left the religion of prophet sallallahu this was gross corruption this was cross corruption, and they took off the chemical, uh, camels and the rain uh, ran away. When Prophet Sallallahu heard about the whole event, what was happening, he sent his um, he sent his companions to pursue them, to follow them, and they were caught and they were brought to Medina, and uh, they were presented before Prophet Sallallahu and then according to the teachings of Quran, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has mentioned in Surah Al Baqarah, the law of qisas. That death or blood for blood, that if a person kills, then he will be put to death according to the order of Qasas. And according to the order of Qasas, we know that the person, the way the murderer kills the person, he is killed in a similar manner. So according to this law of Quran, this, uh, this divine law of uh, Qisas explained in Quran, this was the most strict, this was the most strict of punishment ever, ever enjoined by Prophet Sallallahu in his life in Mecca, that they were made to, they were killed in a similar manner as they had killed the people of the tribe. Even these people, their hands were and feet were cut off and iron hot iron bars and needles, they were uh, pinched into their eyes and they were left uh, thirsty and hungry, waiting for death. So this was the harshest and this was the most strictest of all forms of punishment which were given, which were announced by Prophet Sallallahu because this was according to the law uh, enjoined by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala himself. So after this, this verse was revealed. This incident, after this incident, this verse was revealed. And in this verse, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has suggested four punishments. Allah has suggested four punishments for certain um, certain uh, sins and certain um, forms of crimes that if a person who uh, wages war against Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah and who 
creates corruption or a person who creates theft or a person who murders for 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 crimes allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here has suggested punishments like they will be killed are crucified and their hands and feet will be cut off or the fourth is that they will be exiled so then according to these four the to pick out which to give which which person which criminal will be given which punishment will be decided by the by the judge of the court of the time they have been given the authority to pick out the decision out of these four for those four crimes and this is according to the messages of quran itself except for those except for those who return repenting before you and apprehend them and know that allah is forgiving and merciful o you who have believed fear allah and seek the means of nearness to him and strive in his cause that you may succeed so in this verse number 35 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying what ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu taqullaha wabtaghu ilayhi alwasilata wajahidu fi sabilihi la'allakum tuflihun allah says do what seek a means of nearness to him wabtaghu ilayhi alwasila you strike you make effort and you make struggle to for a means of finding out a nearness to him him means whom towards allah the verse explains that all the believers need to do what they need to find a link a source a connection towards allah towards what for allah towards the nearness for allah for the player of allah to please allah or for the love of allah or for the acceptance of the supplications i repeat again the verse is suggesting that we are being we are being advised and we are being guided that we as muslims we need to find we need to strive struggle or make effort to find a link a source or a connection for the nearness and pleasure of allah for the love of allah and for the acceptance of our our supplications in the court of allah these this uh, verse is sometimes misinterpreted by certain commentators but actually what is the source and the link what is the source and the link is not any but not any any deity other than allah it is what two sources of nearness and two links of nearness and player and love of allah have been explained in the verse itself number one is the fear of allah the fear of allah that is piety pious deeds righteous deeds itself are a source itself are a link and a connection for the love of allah like allah says in quran in allah ma al muttaqin in allah yuhibb al muttaqin wal aqibatu lil muttaqin allah says wal man khafa maqam rabbihi jannatan so there it is a god fearing person a pious person obviously has a source and a link and a connection with the love with the player of allah and his supplications of the pious and the righteous person after performing after doing the righteous deeds may they be any they are accepted blessed and granted and the second thing which the verse itself is here highlighting here is is doing what is striving in the cause of allah jihad jihad striving struggling with our body with our wealth jahidu bi ambalihum wa anfusuhum itself it is a link and it is a source for the player for the love and for the nearness of allah and then we learn from other traditions as well that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when my servant is in prostration i am closest to him similarly another tradition informs all of us that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when the lips of my bondsman move in the remembrance then i am closest to him and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has informed all of us that when a wife is busy in the service of her husband she is closest to allah so for the nearness of allah for the pleasure of allah for the love of allah for the acceptance of supplications in the court of allah we need to do what we need to be pious we need to be we need to excel in righteousness 
and we need to fear Allah and spend a life of piety. And then we need to make jihad. And then we need to, we need to remember Allah, glorify Allah, praise Allah, offer our salah, connect to Quran, and continue the supplications of the morning and the evening and the supplications of the manners of Prophet Sallallahu And then we need to do what? We, we, need to, we need to make frequent prostrations and we need to do what? We need to serve our spouse, our husbands, to get the nearness and pleasure of Allah. Indeed, those who disbelieve if they should have all that is in the earth. That is a picture regarding ransoms for the day of judgment. If they should have all those disbelievers, if they should have all that is in the earth and like of it with it by which to ransom themselves from the punishment of the day of resurrection, it will not be accepted for them. And for them is a painful punishment. What Allah accepts in this life is just a few words of repentance. In this worldly life, a few words, a few phrases of seeking forgiveness. Allahumma inna ka'afuvan kareeman tuhibbul affafaqfu anna. A few words like astaghfirullah rabbi min kulli zambin wa atubu like might be sufficient. And as Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, that spent in the path of Allah even if you spend a part, a quarter of the part of a date to save yourselves from hellfire. So in this worldly life, maybe even spending a part of a date or maybe saying out just astaghfirullah rabbim and kulli zambin wa tubo like with sincere, with sincere state of mind of repentance and seeking forgiveness will be a ransom, will be an atonement, a appiation for everything. But on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, nothing will be accepted. Allahumma ja'alni min at tawabina wa ja'alni min al mutatakhirin. Allahumma ja'alni min at tawabina wa ja'alni min al mutatakhirin. They will wish to get out of fire, but never are they to emerge therefrom, and from them is an enduring punishment. 38. As for the thief, the male and the female amputate their hands in recompense for what they committed as a deterrent punishment from Allah. Allah is exalted and in might and wise. So here in this verse 38 and 39, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining a law of Quran regarding the punishment of theft, the crime of theft, the law of Allah is a sarqa. Sarqa is the divine law, or it is the law of the Quran, which has been explained clearly in these two verses. Remember, had, had is the term which is used in Quran for the law, for the divine law of Quran for a crime, or the punishment suggested by the verses of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, he suggests in the verses of Quran, this punishment is known as a had in the words of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained four divine laws in Quran. The first being explained in Surah Baqarah uh, as uh, the law of Qisas regarding intentional murder. The second is mentioned regarding adultery or zina in uh, Surah Nur, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that hundred uh, punishment of hundred lashes for uh, those who are not married and they commit adultery. And then there is there was a verse which was revealed regarding the rigm or stoning to death for those who commit adultery and, and are married. Similarly, there is the had de qazaf the law for the punishment of a person, 80 lashes for being, uh, being as a punishment for the person who accuses anybody of zina, but fails to find four witnesses. And here in these two verses, 38 and 39, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the crime of theft being created by somebody in an Islamic state who would be punished by the law of sarka, that is the cutting of the amputation of the hands. 
Now, this is a very, very strict punishment. And as you can relate that all these four punishments of the divine law, they themselves tend to be very strict. Regarding Islamic punishments, we need to understand that, first of all, all these Islamic laws, as have been explained as divine laws, they are, number one, they are very strict. They are to be persecuted and to be carried out immediately, and they are conducted publicly, not all by the person alone in a secret compartment. No, they are conducted publicly. And the purpose of all this strict punishment being conducted publicly is to teach the masses a lesson, to make the punishment not to persecute or to torture the criminal, but the purpose is to act as a deterrent in the society, as a deterrent in the society to save the society from committing such crimes and to save the society from the ill effects of all those crimes. The punishments are very intense, very severe, very immediate, and they are conducted publicly in front of the people to make them a deterrent punishment. But still, despite all these facts, there are uh, criticisms which have been raised against all forms of divine laws. Like uh, regarding this also, uh, it has been openly criticized that in, in the law of Quran, cutting off the hands, this is like next to impossible and should not be done. It is inhuman. It is very brutal. I would also want to explain that as far as the law for the cutting amputation of the hands of the thief is concerned, there is a proper detailed charter which the Quran teaches all of us. And this is what we learn from the words of uh, the traditions of Prophet ﷺ. We learn that it is not for all types of thefts. All types of thefts, they are not punished by amputation of the hands or the feet. It is only when the thing which is stolen, it reaches above a minimum level. And that has been taught to us by Hadith is that it has to be something which is more valuable in price as uh, more than 10 dirhams. So the person stealing something which is more than worth 10 dirhams or more will be, uh, hands will be amputated if the crime is, uh, uh, if the crime is proven against the person. Similarly, a thing uh, which should be stolen from a, from a person's personal uh, secured position, like a, a thing which is lying loose and which is not safe, which is not kept, which has not been kept secure, and the owner has not guarded the property or the thing or the possession himself safe enough, that will not be punished because it was a source of attraction and temptation for all those who are the deprived. So let him into it, the theft. So the punishment of amputation of hands will only be conducted if the person or the thief steals or takes away the thing from somebody's protected personal uh, position. And then it will not be uh, given, the punishment will not be exercised for all those who steal food or fruits or toys or musical instruments or even the possessions from the Bethel Mal. And the order of cutting has also been very clearly explained that we learn from Hadith that if a person commits theft, the first to be cut is the left hand of the person so that he can keep on walking and he can keep on working with the right hand and he can earn his source of living so that he doesn't have to commit another uh, theft. The second, if the person after the left hand being cut off still commits another theft, then the right foot will be cut. And then if the person third time, despite these two punishments, such severe intense public punishments, despite continues and still creating a theft for the third time, then the right hand will be cut. And finally, for the fourth punishment, the right, the left foot will be cut. And this is, again, seems to be very practical, even as far as our body is concerned and as far as the medical point is concerned also, because so that this will help the person to keep on work, walking and to keep on initially when the right uh, left arm is cut or left, left hand is cut off and then the right foot is cut off, it is in the cross manner. And the purpose is so that with the right hand, the person can still keep on walking, assisting his cut off right foot to keep on walking him on, uh, for, to let him walk on the crutches even. And then <coughs> finally, 
the right, left foot is cut. So this is the order. And we also received instructions as to how we have to go about the amputation also. We learn that uh, the hands have to be amputated like about four fingers behind the wrist. And uh, today the amputation surgeons, when I uh, connected to them, they told me that this place, which is like four fingers behind the wrist is the place where the collateral circulation and the anastomosis is between the blood vessels are the hand and of the arm this is minimum so when the hand is uh, amputated not at the wrist but slightly behind the blood flow and the bleeding will be minimum as compared to if the hand is amputated at the wrist where there's the pulse and where there's extensive blood supply and collaterals existing with massive anastomosis between the blood vessels that would tend to bleed much more and so the hand is cut off about four fingers behind the wrist. And then we also learn that it has been instructed that immediately after amputating, the stump has to be dipped in boiling, bubbling oil. This is again, not to torture or persecute the criminal. This is for many of the useful things, which will be like this dipping it in the hot bubbling oil. This will act like a cautery today. Cautery we use during surgical procedures to burn off the blood vessels. So this, uh, this uh, hot oil will burn off the cut off open blood vessels and will seal them and will stop and assist in uh, stopping the bleeding. Secondly, it will also clot the blood. It will help to it, it will help the blood to clot, and this will further assist uh, in stopping bleeding. And because we don't want the criminal to bleed to death, we don't want the criminal to lose blood and become weak. So the purpose was just to punish and as a deterrent for the criminal himself, and also as a deterrent for the society. And the third thing, which will be this uh, hot oil, will do is will uh, will disinfect the wound and will help any forms of infection, and will also assist assist and aid in a healthy healing. And uh, the last but not the least, which I learned was that this dipping in the hot bubbling oil will tend to soften the stump. And will this, this will prevent formation of any forms of contractures, which will be painful and which will be more limiting after the amputation. So this is what? This is Allah. Subhanallah. Allah is Rabbul Alameen. Allah is all Rahman and Rahim. And uh, imagine when uh, the person's hand is being chopped off, like people criticizing, this is too harsh a punishment and it is too brutal a punishment. But just realize, even in the days of today, a person committing theft and publicly on a major, a major public place, a person's hands being amputated in front of the public in today's means of communication in the today's social media of today, the, the news and the whole of the videos trending like a jungle fire would be a very, very potent deterrent for the whole of the society to stop creating thefts and the society in which this law of Sarka would be implemented with fair and just manner. Considering all, not the intelligentsia and elite, not leaving them and not just extending uh, punishments to the lower class and the uh, have-nots of the society. When this, when this law, when this divine law of Sarka is with fair justice implemented in the society, there will be no theft and there will be no burglary, there will be no looting and plundering of people's properties. That is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also mentioned Regarding the order of Qasas in Surah uh, Al-Baqarah, Allah says, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِسَاسِ حَيَاتٌ يَا أُولِي لَلْبَابِ but for, um, for Sarka, Allah says in, uh, in the next verse, but whoever repents after his wrongdoing and reforms, indeed, <coughs> Allah will turn to him in forgiveness. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. رَبِّ اغْفِرْ وَرَحَمْ وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الرَّاحِمِينَ do you not know that to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth? He punishes whom he wills and he forgives whom he will. And Allah is over all things competent. O Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let them not grieve you who will hasten into disbelief of those who say we believe with their mouths, but their hearts believe not. Allahumma la taja'alna minhum rabbana innana amanna faqfir lana zunubana wakina azaban nar. 
but their hearts believe not. And from among the Jews, they are avid listeners to falsehood. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning a few sins and evil doings of the people of, um, of the Jews. Allah says they are avid listeners to falsehood, listening to one another, people who have not come to you. They distort words beyond their proper usages, saying, if you are given this, take it. But if you are not given this, then be aware. We remember that by the charter of Medina, the people of uh, the Jews, they used to come to Prophet Sallallahu for their judicial interests also, for the making of decisions regarding their different disputes. So that is what their uh, behavior used to be, that they used to say that if you are given this, that is if Prophet Sallallahu makes a decision regarding any issue which is acceptable for you and which you like and which you opt, then take it. But if you are not given this, then be aware. But he for whom Allah intends fitna, never will you possess uh, whenever will you possess power to do for him anything against Allah? Those are the ones for whom Allah does not intend to purify their hearts. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Allahumma ikhtina sirat al-mustaqeem. For them in this world is disgrace and for them in hereafter is a great punishment. Allah save us all from this punishment. They are avid listeners to falsehood, devourers of what is unlawful. So if they come to you, judge between them or turn away from them. If you turn away from them, never will they harm you at all. And if you judge, judge between them with justice. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. But how is it that they come to you for judgment while they have the Torah in which is the judgment of Allah? Then they turn away even after that. And then Allah says, okay, those who turn away from the divine laws given to the Jews in Torah, all those Jews who turn away from the divine laws explained in their divine scripture, Allah labels them, they are what? They are not, in fact, believers. So all the people of the book who turn away from the implementation of the divine laws, Allah has labeled that they are not the believers. Verse 44, indeed, we sent down the Torah in which there was guidance and light. The prophets who submitted to Allah judged by it for the Jews. That is, the prophets, Hazrat Musa salam, used to make decisions, the lawful decisions, the fair and the just decisions according to the divine law and the divine punishment suggested by the divine law. Judged by it for the Jews, as, the, as did the rabbis and the scholars by that which they were entrusted of the scripture of Allah and they were witnesses thereto. So do not fear the people, but fear me and do not exchange my verses for a small price. Why? Implement, implement the laws of the book of the Quran, the divine laws, implement them. Why? Whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the disbelievers. So in this verse number 44, after verse number 43, Allah, Allah labeled, they are not the believers. And now in the verse number 44, Allah says that those, those societies, those communities, those people, those families, those Muslim states who do not, who do not implement the divine laws, they are in the sight of Allah. فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ They are the disbelievers. We ordained for them therein a life for life, an eye for eye, a nose for nose, an ear for ear, a tooth for tooth, and wounds is a legal retribution. These are what the laws were given to the people of Torah. But whoever gives up his right as charity, it is an expiation for him. And whoever does not judge but by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. Allah says that all those who are in their divine Divine scriptures, they have been handed over and they've been enjoying the divine laws and the hadood of the divine books. If they fail to implement, if they fail to implement these laws in their judicial system, in their social structures, in the systems of government, then they are what? They are the wrongdoers. 
And we sent down, following in their footsteps, Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, confirming that which came before him in Torah. And we gave him the Injil, in which was the guidance and light, and confirming which preceded it of the Torah as a guidance and instruction for the righteous. And let the people of Injil judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And whoever does not judge but what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the defiantly disobedient. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that similar book, Injil, was given to the Christians. And in, in the Injil also, they were given the divine laws regarding the criminal punishments. And has Allah here mentioned that all those of the Christians, even if they do not implement their divine laws, they will be what? They will be they will be the defiantly disobedient and they will be the transgressors. So this, these verses from verse number 44 to 47 clearly highlight the importance of implementation of the divine laws in the Islamic states. Because Allah explains the importance of implementation of these divine laws. And Allah says that these people, they won't be believers. They will be kafirun. They will be the disbelievers. They will be the zwalimun, the wrongdoers. And they will be the fasikun, the transgressors, if they fail to get hold of the divine laws and they implement them in the Islamic state. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let us realize the importance of these divine laws given to us in Quran. And then in the next verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly addresses the followers of Prophet وسلم, explaining the importance of the divine laws explained in Quran. Allah, after commenting all about the people of the book and how they were handed over their divine scriptures and what they were, they were provided with as the divine laws, Allah now directly addresses us. And we have, we have revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the book in truth, confirming that which preceded it of scriptures and as a criterion over it. So you do what? You, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and your followers, you do what? So judge between them by what Allah has revealed you. May it be qasas, may it be adultery, may it be had qazaf, may it be sarka. You do what? You judge between them by what Allah has revealed to you and do not follow their inclinations away from what has come to you out of truth. To each of you, we prescribed a law and a method. Had Allah willed, he would have made you one nation, united in religion, but he intended to test you in what he has given you. So raise to, so raise to all that is good. To Allah is your return all together, and he will then inform you concerning that over which you used to differ. And now you do what? And judge, judge Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam between them by what Allah has revealed and do not follow their inclinations and beware of them lest they tempt you away from some of what Allah has revealed to you. And if they turn away, then know that Allah only intends to afflict them with some of their own sins. And indeed, many among the people are defiantly disobedient. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. And then is it the judgment of the time of ignorance they desire? So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a very strict and a very aggressive manner is labeling that all the believing states and all the Islamic states and all the followers of the prophets, if they, despite receiving their books, despite receiving the divine guidance, despite understanding despite understanding the divine laws, the hadood, they fail to make these laws as the system of their judiciary, as the system of their government. They will be, they will be asking for what? For laws and for judgment of ignorance. A'uzu billahi an akuna min al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us struggle and strive and make efforts not only for the treating and for the preaching and for the spreading of the verses of Quran and Hadith, but also let us help, help us, all of us, to struggle and to strive actually for the implementation of Quran. 
for the actual implementation of Quran. On the land of Allah, on the land of Lord, let us be one of those who implement the system, the orders, the commandments, the laws, the legal, the illegal, the lawful and the unlawful commandments of Quran on the, on the land of the Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us be all of them. But who is better than Allah in judgment for a people who are certain in faith? O oh, you who have believed, do not take the Jews or Christians as allies. They are in fact allies of one another. And whoever is an ally to them among you, then indeed he is the one of them. Indeed, Allah guides not the wrongdoing people. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, similar to what we went through in Surah Al-Imran, Allah is guiding us regarding our human relationships. And the human relationship which here has been we have been guided about is the relationship of wala wala is a relationship of what form the characteristics of wala are that it is a very near and a dear a heartfelt bond of love and the two people having wala they are not just, they don't just have a heartfelt love of bond, bond of love, but they 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 share their secrets with one another and they take advices from one another. They are future, uh, frequently found counseling with each other and they copy, they idolize, they glamorize each other. And then they share their, uh, me, their methods of entertainment as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned us in Surah Al-Imran that Muslims, they do not have to make this form of a relationship of wala with the disbelievers, with the kafirin. And here now in this Surah Al-Maidah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling all of us in a very clear and a categorical don't of the verse is that we do not have to indulge in this form of a relationship with the Jews or with the Christians or the people of the book even. And this will be, this order has to be obeyed at all levels. May it be at the state level. An Islamic state will not be uh, copying or imitating or uh, counseling or taking advices or following a non-Islamic state or the state of the people of the book, like the Jews and the Christians. And we will not be holding friendly boy or bonds and ties with them. This is, this is unlawful according to this verse of Quran. And similarly, the order has to be obeyed also at the individual level, at the individual level, at the personal level, at the social level, and the national level, we do not have to indulge in any form of relationships of wala with the Jews, with the Christians, or with the non-believers as well. Because this will be what? This will be influencing. This will be directly and indirectly having a massive influence on our own faith, our own belief, and our deeds also. So you see those in whose hearts is a disease hastening into association with them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you that you do not have to make any form of this relationship with the Jews and with the Christians. But you see, those who have a disease in their heart, these are whom? These are the hypocrites. Hastening into association with them. Them means what? The Jews and the Christians saying, we are afraid a misfortune may strike us, but perhaps Allah will bring conquest or a decision from him and they will become over what they have been concealing within themselves, regretful. And those who believe will say, are these the ones, are these the ones who swore by Allah their strongest oaths that they indeed, they were with you, their deeds have become worthless and they have become the losers. Words number 54, O oh, you who have believed whoever of you should, whoever of you should revert from his religion, Allah will bring forth in place of them a people he will love and who will love him. So here in this verse number 54 and 55, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is narrating the manners, the behaviors and the traits of all those whom Allah loves. So whom does Allah love? Let's go through the verse now. Allah says that he will love those who will love him. Ask Allah, supplicate to Allah for his love. Allahumma inni as'aluka 
Hubbaka, wa hubba may you hibbuka, wa amala lazi yo baliguni hubbaka. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us and bless us, attain your love as the ultimate and the maximum love for as compared to all the worldly possessions of the life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bless us with the love of all those you love and who love you. And bless us for the love of all those righteous deeds which will guide us to your love. So Allah loves those who will love him and those who are humbled towards the believers. And second and third, they are powerful against the disbelievers. And fourth, they strive in the cause of Allah. That is, they make jihad in the cause of Allah. And fourth, the last but not the least is, And they do not fear while obeying Allah, while submitting and surrendering to the commandments of Allah, while teaching, preaching, implementing the messages of Allah, they do not fear the blame of a critic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us remember and help us, help us develop these traits within us so that we may be, we may be those worthy ones which are, which have been blessed by the reward of the blessed of the love of Allah. That is the favor of Allah. He bestows it upon whom he wills, and Allah is all encompassing and knowing. So now, in the previous verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told all of us, all the reciters and all the followers of uh, uh, Prophet ﷺ, that we are not supposed to take allies. We are not supposed to take allies with the disbelievers or even with the people of the book. Now, taking allies is a definite requirement, a social, psychological, emotional, and even sometimes economic requirement of all the bondsmen. So where do we take allies from? The verse number 55 explains, your ally, your ally is none but Allah. Your ally is none but Allah, and therefore his messenger and those who believe. So you take allies as whom? Who are believers. And what? how will you decide who is the believer, the merits and the preferences and the two priorities, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is explaining would help us make the decision who a believer is. The believers are those who establish salah and give zakah and they bow down in worship. So establishing apsara and paying off the obligatory zakat and bowing down in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what is a decisive factor in deciding that a bondsman is a believer of Allah. Salah is what, as Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has reported, بَيْنَ الْعَبْدِ وَبَيْنَ الْقُفْرِ تَرْقِ السَّلَاةِ between, between Islam and between the, between the true bondsmen and servants of Allah and between the disbelievers is what? It's just the act of abandoning, of leaving salah. And the Prophet ﷺ has said, وَمَنْ تَرِقَهُ مُتَعَمْبِدًا فَقَدْ قَرَجًا مِنَ الْمِلَّةِ Any person, any person, if he leaves, intentionally leaves salah, intentionally abandons salah, then he is what? He is turned out of the Ummah of Prophet ﷺ. He is not from among the believers. So this is establishing of Salah and obviously giving off the obligatory, paying of the obligatory zakat. Allah, Zina, Prophet Allah, Allah says in Quran, Allah Zina la yu'minuna bil akhirati. Allah Zina la yutuna zakata. That those who fail to uh, pay their obligatory zakat, these are those who fail to believe on the day of judgment. The day of judgment where people will be definitely trading and bartering for the palaces of Jannah through what? To what they have spent in the path of Allah. May it be zakat or may it be their super erogatory charities in the path of Allah. But this is what is going to lead to barter for Jannah not themselves. And whoever is an ally of Allah and his messenger and those who have believed, indeed, Hezbollah, the party of Allah, they will be the predominant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us one of them. 
O you who have believed, take not those who have taken your religion in ridicule and amusement among the ones who were given the scripture before you, nor the disbelievers as allies. And fear Allah if you should truly be believers. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the reason why we do not have to take the disbelievers and the people of the book of uh, the books as uh, allies because they make fun they make fun of our religion they make they make uh, criticize they try to defame the teachings of quran hadith and sunnah and they take it in ridicule and they take it in amusement and they mock the messages of allah so that is why if you stay in their company and if you uh, make them allies then you might start getting impressed by them and you might in impression out of them you might indulge in similar activities or develop a similar state of mind also and how do they ridicule and how do they make fun and mock of uh, the commandments and of the uh, manners of the believers and the Muslims is verse number 58. And when you call to prayers, that is when the proclamation of salah, the azan is being called out. What do they do? They take it in ridicule and amusement. That is because they are people who do not reason. Proclamation of salah. The Jews, they used to make fun of it and they used to mock it and they used to ridicule it when the proclamation for Salah or the Azan was to be called. And they used to try to interrupt by their hand claps and by their whistles or by their drum beats. They used to try to interfere the offering of the congregational Salah also. And we learned from traditions that there was a Jew in Medina who was at total enmity with Prophet Sallallahu He had not believed, but he was in total enmity in Auzubillah in a state of hatred for Prophet Sallallahu And when Hazrat Bilal was Allah and who he used to announce these words of Azan from the mosque of uh, Medina, then this Jew, he out of sheer anger and frustration and hostility, he used to say that may, he used to supplicate for Hazrat Bilal that may he be cursed and may he burn Nauzubillah to death. And you know what? When there is a person who is a wrongdoer and is making a supplication for a person who is not deservant of that, then what we learn uh, happens actually is that these words of supplication, they are taken up to the heaven and then they are returned. And if the person for whom these words are being supplicated for, if he is himself an oppressor or he is a wrongdoer, then the supplication, this harsh words of supplication, he wouldn't be deservant of that. But if the person for whom these words are not being called, uh, are being called upon, if he is not deservant, and if he is not a sinner, and if he is not a wrongdoer or an oppressor, then what happens is the supplication returns to the person who had made this malice of a, of a supplication. This evil supplication, a person who had made, returns towards the evildoer himself. And uh, it becomes, it is accepted for him himself. So what happened was that this Jew who used to supplicate for, uh, for uh, Hazrat Bilal to be, now Zubillah, to be burned to death, Harrak al Qazib, he used to say, but what happened was that uh, there was a young daughter of this Jew. She had got some uh, fire for the house. And as Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was instructed in a tradition that when you sleep, what you should do, you should do is that you should cover up all the pots, containers of foods, and then you should close and lock your door saying Bismillah, and you should extinguish all the fire and all the flames before sleeping. So what the Jew did was, that they just the family just forgot to put off the fire and when they all slept the whole family was sleeping and the fire and the flames burned all the house and all the possessions and all the family members to death so this was why because he was supplicating he was making an evil supplication a supplication of malice for Hazrat Bilal radiallahu ta'ala and who, who was definitely not deservant of it. So the supplication was returned to the Jew and in return, he was burnt and the whole house was burnt. As far as the proclamation for Salah is concerned, we uh, understand and we learn from traditions that uh, this proclamation of Salah, that is the, the words of Azan, they were introduced after some time of uh, immigration from Makkah 
to Medina. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he initially, he uh, immigrated to Medina, initially there were just a few Muslims, a handful of Muslims. And uh, when there would be time of Salah, people used to just gather by themselves in, mos in the Masjid in Abbi, and no intimation or notification was needed whatsoever. But when the Muslim population of Medina, they started to increase and they started spreading slightly farther away from the Masjid in Abbi also, then there arose an issue of how to inform people regarding the starting of the congregational salah and how to pass on the information and how to invite them. So Prophet Wasallam gathered his companions to make a consultation because taking advice and taking cons making consultation is itself what? It is an order of Quran. And we see in the life of Prophet Wasallam very frequently making consultation with his companions. So the companions were gathered and um, they were consulting that uh, asking each other, decide, trying to decide how to inform people about the congregational salah in the mosque. And there came different suggestions, like some of them suggested that we'll just let's light fire. And then there were other who suggested that let's ring a bell like Jews. And uh, there were different suggestions which were coming, but there was the people had not reached at a final decision that uh, the time for Salah approached and came and the whole of this counseling meeting, it just uh, was dispersed. Now, after offering salah, has that Abdullah bin Zaid, ta'ala, and who he explains that uh, after um, after the congregational salah, we all came over to our house, and I was a bit upset and I was a bit anxious that a final decision could not be made. So he said that I just lay down and I dozed off, and I had a dream, and there I saw that I had I had a bigel in my hand, and I was walking on a, in a street, and I was going towards the market, and I met a man. And the man, he stopped me and he asked me where I was going. I told him that I was going towards the marketplace and I was going to, I was going to blow in this horn or the bigel to let the people know that it is the time for Salah. And as Abdullah bin Zaid said, that that person told me in my dream that instead of this method and manner of informing people about the time of the congregational Salah, should I suggest you an alternative uh, alternative uh, few words and few verses. Uh, and then uh, when Hazrat Abdullah, he agreed in his dream, the person suggested the whole words of the proclamation of Salah. When immediately he got up, he woke, he got up and he rushed to Prophet Salah Islam in the mosque. And uh, he told him all about narrated his dream. And immediately before that, Prophet Salah Islam had also received the revolution regarding the proclamation of Salah. And uh, uh, listening to all what Hazrat Abdullah bin Zaid had uh, narrated his dream, and similar was the words of revolution of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered Hazrat Bilal Rasulullah Taala and who he was what he was a Negro. He was a Negro. He was a black, and he was poor, and he was totally an underprivileged person of the Muslim society. And moreover, he was a freed slave. So this was the justice, this was the fair dealing, because obviously his voice was, he had a loud voice. So he asked Hazrat uh, Bilal Raziallahu ta'ala anhu, and this shows what? This shows equality, this shows justice, this shows fair dealing, and this shows Muslim equality in the Muslim society. And he asked Hazrat, um, uh, Hazrat Bilal Raziallahu ta'ala anhu to get up, and he asked uh, Hazrat Abdullah bin Zaid Raziallahu ta'ala and who to keep on reciting the verses he had been told in his dream and um, Hazrat Bilal followed. And this was the first occasion when the proclamation for Salah was announced from the mosque of uh, Medina. And there afterwards, till now, it is it has been proven by the Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Say, O people of scripture, do you do you resent us except for the fact that we have believed in Allah and what has been revealed to us and what was revealed before and because most of you are defiantly disobedient? Say, shall I inform you of what is worse than, than that as a penalty from Allah? It is that of those whom Allah has cursed. Remember, for any deed or for any sin or crime, when the words is of words of being cursed by Allah comes, that is what that is a major sin. That it is that of those whom Allah has cursed, and with 
with whom he became angry and made them of apes and pigs and slaves of Tahud. Those are the worst in position and further astray from the sound way. Allahumma ikhtina sirat al mustaqim. Allahumma ikhtina sirat al mustaqim. Allahumma ikhtina sirat al mustaqim. But when they came to you, they say, We believe. But they have entered into disbelief with their hearts, and they have certainly left with it. They have they have certainly left with it, and Allah is most knowing of what they were concealing. And you see many of them hastening into sin and aggression and the devouring of what is unlawful. How wretched is what they have been doing. Why do the rabbis and the religious scholars not forbid them from saying what is sinful and devouring what is unlawful? How wretched is what they have been practicing. And the Jews say, the hand of Allah is chained. Chained are their hands and cursed are they for what they say. This is what the Jews used to come up when the verses they uh, were instructed in the verses they were instructed to spend zakat, obligatory zakat, and to spend supererogatory charities in the path of Allah. They used to say that Allah, the creator, the, uh, the provider, the sustainer, is are his hands chained up that he asks us to spend and feed his bondsmen? So Allah answered, chained are their hands and cursed are they for what they say. Rather, both his hands are extended. He spends however he wills. And that which has been revealed to you from your Lord will surely increase many of them in transgression and disbelief. And we have cast among them animosity and hatred until the day of resurrection. Every time they kindle the fire of war against you, Allah extinguished it. And they strive throughout the land causing corruption and Allah does not like corruptors. And if only the people of scripture had believed and feared Allah, two things, belief and piety. They had believed and they had feared Allah. What was the reward for them? Allah says, we would have removed from them their misdeeds and admitted them to gardens of paradise. And if only they upheld the laws of Torah and the Injil, what has been revealed to them from the Lord, they would have consumed provisions from above them and from beneath their feet. Among them are a moderate community, but many of them, evil is that which they do. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising. Allah is promising and mentioning that even if the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, whose books, whose books were not complete, their books were not perfected. And above all, their books were not protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those who were the people of books which were not complete, which were not perfected, which were not protected, even if they, if they upheld the laws of their divine scriptures, they would have been blessed with, they would have been blessed with multiple and plentiful of provisions in their worldly life. So this is the reward of what? implementing the implementing the divine laws in the land of law in the land of the lord so just imagine just imagine if we if we the followers of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if we the reciters of the best quran al majid quran al hakim if we implement the divine laws of the Quran in our Islamic states, in our society, all these customs, all these norms go away and we implement the moral code of life and the code of ethics and the Islamic system of life in the system of government, in the system of judiciary, what provisions and what blessings would we receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the immense reward we will receive. Allah help us understand the importance and help us be one of those who strive and struggle for the protection of the laws of Quran and for the implementation of the teachings and messages and the implementation of the laws of the Lord in the land of the Lord. O Messenger, announce, announce that which has been revealed to you from your Lord. And if you do not, then you have not conveyed his message and Allah will protect you from the people. Indeed, Allah does not guide the disbelieving people. Verse number 67, 
Allah is giving an order, enjoining Prophet Sallallahu to do something and is indirectly ordering all of us, the followers of Prophet Sallallahu the same thing also. The order is Balir. Balir ma unzila ilayka mirwabik. That preach, spread, announce. I repeat again, Balir means to preach, to preach, to spread, to announce the teachings of the Quran. Allah says, this is an order. Balir was an order issued to Prophet ﷺ in his life. And we know that there is no order of Quran. There is absolutely no order of Quran which Prophet ﷺ did not obey. So because of this order of Quran, the entire life of Prophet Sallallahu became what? It became a mission of preaching, teaching, announcing, introducing, and above all, implementing the teachings of Quran. He would preach. He would preach, preach, and preach day in and day out, day, night, all seasons, summer, winter, raining, autumn, all seasons, to all around him, to the rich, poor, black or white, slaves or masters, young or old, women or men, even friends, even enemies, even relatives or strangers, he would, he would preach and teach the messages of Quran to everyone, to everyone, everywhere, all the time, under all conditions, even when in the 10th year of prophethood, he was refused, he was dejected. But then he went over to Taif all by himself, unaccompanied, walking by foot. So that, this is the life. This turned out after the order of Balir. This Balir, the order of Balir, made, made teaching, preaching of the messages of Allah as his mission of life. And you know what? All the problems, all the crises, all the trials, all the hardships he had to face in his life were because of what? Were basically because of preaching. Would basically because of preaching. Because you know, if he, he was renowned as what? He was an apple of their eyes. They used to consult him. They used to take his counseling and his advice regarding making their decisions. He was there appointing and fixing their black stone, settling their issues, settling their disputes. He was well known as the Asadi Kalamin, the truthful and the trustworthy. He was an apple of the eye. He was the son of the leader of the Quraysh. If he, if he had just resided in his personal apartments and kept on praying, offering salah, keeping his fast, reciting the verses of Quran, doing the remembrance of Allah, glorifying Allah, exalting Allah, but just staying within his own apartment doing all this, his personal acts of worship, if he had just limited himself to that, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have done anything to him. They wouldn't have hurt him. They wouldn't have called him by bad names. They wouldn't have accused him. They wouldn't have opposed them. And they wouldn't have persecuted and tortured his companions. No. But all what he had to suffer and all the trials which came to him in his life, like so immense. Just imagine. He, his cooking pots, they were filled up with filth. Thorny brushes, they were, they were just spread in front of his gate. And, and then filth was thrown in his hair. He, he went down into prostration and they picked up a filth loaded uterus of a she camel and put it, put it on his back. He was, he was forced out of Medina to stay back in Shabi Abi Talib. And in all that siege, the people, the Muslims and even Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were forced to, they were forced to eat leaves. They were forced to suck in. They were forced to suck in leather by dipping it in water. And then hunger and poverty forced them to tie, tie stones on their bellies when they were acutely hungry. All this and even much, much more, he being stoned till he was, till blood filled his shoes. All this came, why? This all came because he was obeying the order of Allah, Balir. 
he was he was spreading them he was talking against their idols he was talking against their system he was trying to change their systems according to the teachings of islam and he was trying to implement the messages of islam and the and the messages of and the commandments of the lord on the land of the lord that is why the whole of the opposition but he did not stop nothing deterred him his position was wala yakhafuna lawmat alaim and then finally and then finally 10th year after the immigration to medina he is in his farewell pilgrimage and he is reciting the farewell sermon and with thousands of people standing in front of him he asked all of them have i delivered you the message of allah and they all they all with consensus of uh, consensus of opinion they all came out with one sentence yes we witness that you have you have conveyed to us the message of allah and then he instructed he said fal yuballighul ghaib wa shahid now i was told that i do ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik and now i instruct you all that now from here onwards you all all of you present here whatever you have heard whatever you have received from you you want to pass it on to others all those who are absent and then he raised his hand and he supplicated nadarallahu imran samaya minna that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep the person fresh keep the person fresh and keep the person contented who heard something from me and and conveyed and passed it on to others and it was because of this you know because of this verse ab surah maida balligh ma unzila ilayka mir rabbik from allah to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and indirectly to all of us and then the words of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fal yuballighul ghaib wa shahid and then to come up to the level of the supplication of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to acquire that reward he has promised and he supplicated for the believers for the preachers and for the teachers and for the implementers and for the guards of protectors of quran the lives of the companions they became they became they became a mission of preaching and teaching and implementation of quran the life of the companions became a full mission of dawa because we know that after the conquest of makka all these companions of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they did not settle in medina they could have very much all of them all of these companions they could have very much settled down in medina here dividing all the wealth all the property all the positions all the power authority designations among themselves and enjoying themselves in medina no but because of these orders of quran these words of the hadith and these supplications of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they spread out they scattered they scattered over the land to teach to preach and to implement the orders and the laws of quran on the land of the lord they spread out to different lands and we learn where different parts of the world they are they have been buried in the graves of the companions in all the different parts of the world is a definite proof of how their lives just became a mission for preaching and teaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us important relate the importance of this and adopt this in our life and help us spend our time our wealth our energy our children our houses our vehicles for all the service for preaching and teaching and for the implementation of Quran in the land of Allah and in response to uh, this order that Allah said balligh ma unzila ilayka mir rabbik Allah said Allah made a promise to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wallahu yasimuka min an-nas that allah will if you spread the verses of allah if you announce and spread the messages of allah and implement the order of allah on his land then allah will do what allah promised allah will protect you from the land from other people wa man awfa bi ahdihi min allah and who is most trustworthy and who is more fulfilling of his promise than allah and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised wallahu yasimuka min an-nas that i'll save you from your enemies who will be trying to deter you from the implementation and preaching of quran then i will save you and allah did you know you know there is no person on the earth who had to face 17 assassination attempts and it was who it was prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam assassination attempts 17 times and he comes out unscathed 
This is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised him that if you preach and if you teach and if you spread the messages and words of Allah and if you strive and struggle to implement implement the system of Quran on the land of the Lord, then I will save you and Allah did. Say, O people of the scripture, you are standing on nothing. You are standing on nothing until you uphold the law of Torah and the Injil and what has been revealed to you from your Lord and that which has been revealed to you from your Lord which surely increase many of them in transgression and disbelief. So do not grieve over the disbelieving people. Indeed, those who have believed in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those before him who were Jews or Sabayin or Christians, those among them who believed in Allah and the last day and did righteousness, no fear will there be concerning them or nor will they grieve. For which Christians, for which Jews is this promise of forgiveness being made is all those like all those Jews who believed in Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and who acted upon the commandments of the Torah and they were pious and righteous believers, they, before the prophethood of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, they obeyed the Torah and they believed in Torah and Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and they were righteous and pious. Their, their iman and their belief and faith was complete and perfect and their, their deeds were righteous and pious. So it is for those Jews who before Hazrat Isa alayhi salam came up to this level. Similarly, those Christians, all those Christians who before the advent of Islam, who before the revolution of Quran, who before the prophethood of Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, they, they believed in their prophets. They believed in Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, and they believed in Injil and they acted upon the messages of Allah and Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, and they were righteous and they were guided and they were pious. It is a promise for those Christians. But all those Christians and all those Jews who after the advent of Islam, the prophethood of Prophet وسلم, and the revolution of Quran failed to believe in any one of them or all of them, obviously since their faith and since their belief is not perfected and complete, so for them is no promise of forgiveness and for them has been repeatedly in Quran mentioned hellfire. We had already taken the covenant of the children of Israel and had sent down to them messengers. Whenever there came to them a messenger with what? Their souls did not desire. A party of messengers they denied and a party of them they killed. And they thought doing such a thing, doing such a grievous major sin, they thought there would be no resulting punishment. So they became blind and deaf. And then Allah turned to them in forgiveness. And then again, many of them became blind and deaf. And Allah is seeing of what they do. They have certainly disbelieved who said, Allah is... <coughs> They have certainly disbelieved who said Allah is Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam. While Isa alayhi salam himself, he said what? O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Indeed, he who associates other others with Allah, Allah has forbidden him paradise and his refuge is the fire and there are not for the wrongdoers any help. So in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is repeatedly warning, warning all the Jews and all the Christians, not only warning them, inviting them towards the right and the true faith and inviting them to seek, uh, seek repentance and forgiveness and uh, convert to Islam and accept the messages of Prophet Sallallahu and Quran. And at the same time, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, along with admonishing them, has negated has negated the falsehood of all the innovations they had falsely created about their concepts of faith and belief, especially about the concept of Trinity, the concept of three gods and finding deities in prophets except Allah. <clears throat> 
They have certainly disbelieved who said Allah is the third of the three and there is no God except one. The concept of Christians, the concept of Trinity, which evolved like four centuries after the death of Hazrat Isa salam, and was in the fourth century announced by the Pope of Rome as their religious belief. It believes what? They say that there are three gods. And one school of thought is that they say that there is Allah, there is Hazrat Jibrail alayhi salam, and there is Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. These are three gods. And the second school of thought, according to few Christian scholars, is that the three gods is Allah, is Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, and Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, taking Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, Nazubillah, as the wife of Allah, and Hazrat Isa alayhi salam as the son of Allah. So this is the concept of three gods. And with this concept of Trinity, they say that there are three gods and yet, but there is one God. So according to them, they believe that all these three, Na'uzubillah, Summa Na'uzubillah, Mizali, these three gods, they make up together one God. Allah says, there is no God except one God. And if they do not desist, from what they are saying, they will surely afflict the disbelievers among them a painful punishment. So will they not repent to Allah and seek his forgiveness? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, was not but a messenger. And other messengers have passed on before him. And his mother was a supporter of truth. They both used to eat food. Look how we make it clear to them the signs. Then look how they are deluded. Say, do you worship besides Allah that which holds for you no power of harm or belief? while it is Allah who is the hearing and the knowing. Say, O oh people of the scripture, do not exceed limits in your religion beyond the truth and do not follow the inclinations of a people who had gone astray before and misled many and have strayed from the soundness of the way. So in this verse number 77, Allah is enjoining Allah, a don't of the Quran, Allah says, La taglu fi dinikum. Taglu, oiluf means what? It means overdoing, crossing limits, crossing boundaries, indulging in something which is like too much. Crossing a limit in something is what Ghuluv is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing all the reciters as well as all the previous people of the book whose wrong beliefs, whose concepts of Trinity, whose concepts of finding prophets as deities of Allah has been negated and they have been warned against the, uh, the punishment of all these evil beliefs. As here Allah mentioning clearly a don't that don't don't cross limits, don't become too much, and don't exceed beyond limits in what? Actually, what happened was that the Christians and the Jews, out of sheer love, out of sheer love and respect and regard of their prophets, after believing in their prophets, out of love, respect, regard, and out of uh, love of their prophets, they raised the level of their prophets from prophethood and from human beings to deities of Allah, to sons of Allah. So this is exactly which led to them going astray and led to their creating, uh, indulging in polytheism and false innovations. So this is what exactly Allah is stopping all of us that you definitely need to love Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heads and shoulders above the rest of the people around you. Definitely, but do not have to exceed and cross the limits which have been explained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the love and respect and regard of prophets. And that is exactly what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has instructed all of us in traditions. It has been said that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say that you should not indulge in the manners of the previous people of the book who, who made who made the angels or who made their prophets as sons of Allah or as deities with Allah. But you say for me that I am what? Inni Abdullah wa Rasuluhu, that I am a servant of Allah and I am a prophet or a messenger of Allah. 
So that is what Prophet ﷺ has also instructed us. And this was similarly what Hazrat Isa ﷺ had instructed his followers also. Cursed were those who disbelieved among the children of Israel by the tongue of Dawood and of Isa السلام, the son of Maryam السلام, that was because they disobeyed and habitually transgressed. So activities of, uh, because of uh, which activities have they been cursed by the words of their, uh, of their prophets were because they had left away the activities of cleaning, of purifying their societies and their communities. They had given up the task of what? Of enjoining what is good and virtuous and righteous and stopping and preventing and trying to withhold what is evil, what is sinful and what is trans transgression that is they had stopped what amr bil maruf and nahi anil munkar and so they were cursed in the words of their prophets allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us relate the importance of amr bil maruf and nahi anil munkar and help us be one of those carry all this in our own societies verse number 79 they used not to prevent one another from wrongdoings that they did. How wretched was that which they were doing? You see many of them becoming allies of those who disbelieve. How wretched is that which they have put forth for themselves in that Allah has become angry with them and in the punishment they will abide eternally. And if they had believed in Allah and Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in what, in what was revealed to him, they would not have taken them as allies, but many of them are defiantly disobedient. You will surely find the most intense of the people in animosity towards the believers to be the Jews and those who associate others with Allah. And you will find the nearest of them in affection to the believers, those who say we are the Christians. And why is it so? That is because among them are priests and monks and because they are not arrogant. Verse number 83, and when they hear, and when they hear what has been revealed to messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears because of what they have recognized of the truth. They say, our Lord, we have believed, so register us among the witnesses. Verse number 83 and 84, these two verses, they have been revealed regarding an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this mentions what? This mentions what happened uh, in the court of Abyssinia in response to the king Najashi or Nigas listening to the verses of Surah Maryam. How did it all happen? Inshallah, we'll be talking about in a greater detail in Surah Taha uh, and Surah Maryam, where I will be reciting the, uh, narrating the whole event in detail. But what happened was that when people uh, there in during their stay in Mecca, they were being persecuted the new Muslim converts, they were being extensively tortured and persecuted. So Prophet ﷺ advised them to shift to Abyssinia, mentioning that the king was a fair and a just ruler, and they might shift there and they might like succeed in uh, protecting and saving their iman and faith and belief, and they might be able to strive according to the messages of Quran. So Hazrat Jafar radiallahu ta'ala and who Prophet sallallahu maternal cousin, the brother of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who he, he, along with a few companions in which there was Hazrat Usman salam, Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala and, who, and his uh, wife, Prophet sallallahu daughter also. And that is why Prophet sallallahu said, that they, that is Hazrat Usman and his wife, the daughter of Prophet Sallallahu they are the first couple who has immigrated for the sake of faith after Hazrat Ibrahim Salam and Hazrat Hajra. So when they went to uh, Abyssinia, the people of Mecca, they pursued them and there was a hearing in the court. But on the second day, when the people of Quraysh, they asked uh, on the, um, the hearing for the first day, when um, Najashi had called Hazrat, uh, Hazrat Jafar and asked that they are uh, people from Quraysh, they are putting accusations on you and they have allegations against you that they are, you people are their religious rebels and you have revolted against their, the ancestor 
of their ancestral religion, then what do you have to say? Hazrat um, Jafar was very brave and bold, and he introduced what the way their manner was before the advent of Islam, how they had looted and plundered and killed and murdered, and how they used to bury their daughters and how they 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 drank and they gambled. But then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was kind to them, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then Hazrat Jafar introduced the messages of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So listening to all this. Um, Nigus, he allowed the Muslims to carry on their stay in Abyssinia. Now, the people of Quraysh, they were they were furious. And the second day, they came over and they asked Najashi to ask the Muslims what their messages and what their book had to say about Hazrat Isa Islam and Hazrat Maryam, because they knew very much that the teachings of Quran are exactly opposite and they are negating the faith and the belief of Trinity. So has that the um, um. Jafar bin Abu Talib, he was summoned with his companions again in the court, and there he stood up and niggas, he asked him that what did their book have to say about Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam and the birth and the whole creation. And there Hazrat Jafar was standing as a bold, as a bold Muslim. And he was there, he started reciting the verses of Surah Maryam. And this is exactly what was the state of affairs of Najashi and his court. That uh, Hazrat uh, Jafar was boldly and confidently reciting the verses of Surah Maryam. And uh, there was the truth. The truth was clearly mentioned much against the beliefs of the Christians. But Najashi kept on listening silently. And then when the verses were completely recited, he picked up a straw from the ground. And he called out all the people in the court and his courtiers. He called out to them and he said that by Allah what was recited was the absolute truth and Hazrat Isa was not a bit more than this and not less than this straw and tears were flowing down his eyes when he was listening to the recitation of the verses of Quran in acceptance of Islam and in recognition of the truth which he had been deprived of in his previous life and he accepted and embraced Islam but uh, we do learn that he did not um, come to see Prophet Sallallahu and he did not pay a visit to uh, Medina. But he had accepted Islam as, as a proof from what we get. Uh, we learn from these verses also. And we also learn that when uh, he passed away, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he offered a funeral salah for um, uh, Najashi also in Medina. So here Allah mentions that you see that their eyes overflow, are overflowing with tears because of what they have recognized of the truth. They say, our Lord, we have believed. So this verse itself shows that Najashi had embraced Islam and he had believed in Prophet Sallallahu Our Lord, we have believed. So register us among the witnesses. And why should we not be the believers in Allah and what has come to us of truth? And we aspire that our Lord will admit us to Jannah with the righteous people. So Allah rewarded them for what they said with gardens in paradise beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide eternally, and that is the reward of doers of good. But those who disbelieved and denied our signs, they are the companions of hellfire. Allahumma hasibna khisab bin yasira. ربنا لا تزع قلوبنا بعد إذ خديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسكون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين